Good morning. Uh, this video goes with the second week of work for the semester, and it's titled Western European Expansion and the Ottoman Habsburg Struggle. Uh, I do hope that you'll take a minute or two to watch this. I'll try to keep it short for you. Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, what happens after the Crusades, I'm going to talk about the Habsburg family, and then the creation of the Ottoman Empire. Now, after many years of peace between European Muslim, Christian Muslim, uh, factions after the bulk of the Crusades are over, there's going to be the resumption of warfare on the Iberian Peninsula. And the Iberian Peninsula, that makes up Andorra, Spain, and Portugal today. Somewhere around the 1200s, uh, religious warfare is going to break out. And it's going to turn into this, this series of battles known as the Reconquista. <laughs> A couple different reasons for this. Um, one, the Christian forces are going to try and push Islam off of the European continent. And then the strengthening of both Portugal and Spain are going to do this as well. Now the idea was to remove Muslims from Iberia, and this is going to be finally accomplished following the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain in the year 1469. In 1492, uh, the Spanish forces are going to conquer the city of Granada, and there's going to be continued reconquering of cities in both Portugal and Spain. Eventually, Portugal is going to begin looking to bypass Muslim traders and try and do their trading directly with West Africans, which is going to lead to European exploration. Now, I think it's really important to know that European exploration, it has nothing to do with population. It's really going to happen because by the 1400s, governments are strong enough that they can tell people what to do. And there's going to be a series of new inventions that are going to allow exploration to be easier. What are those new inventions? Well, there are things like different types of ships, uh, the astrolabe, the compass, things that are going to make sailing easier. Now, the resumption of the Reconquista it had some effects on Spain. For example, the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, Catalonia, uh, unite through the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella. When that union happens in Spain, uh, there's going to be a reformation on education, religion, military. The entire Spanish way of life is going to be changed and created. All of the reforms that happen are going to increase the power of the monarchy. Uh, in Portugal... Their exploration efforts, they're going to be the first to really do exploring. And they're going to gain control of the gold trade and silver trade. And the Portuguese are going to be, for just a little while, the strongest country in Europe. Um, both in Portugal and Spain, uh, in 1492, uh, the Jewish people are forced to convert to Christianity or to leave and go elsewhere. Eventually, those forced conversions are going to extend to Muslims as well. And non-Christian books are burned and mosques are going to be turned into churches. So, at the same time this is going on, uh, we have the Ottoman Empire that's happening in Eastern Europe or Western Asia, depending on how you want to define it. And what we know today is the Ottoman Empire. It's created in the late 1200s, early 1300s by this warlord named Osman. And Osman is where the term Ottoman comes from. Now, the reason they're able to expand so quickly is because they have gunpowder. Uh, they're one of the first people outside of China to use gunpowder. It's also very culturally diverse. There's a lot of different people who are involved in it. <clears throat> now, the rise of the Ottoman Empire is directly related to the end of the Byzantine Empire. Now, long story short here, um, the Byzantine Empire goes back to the year 330, before our class really begins. It used to be part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire splits into two. And the Byzantine Empire, with its capital in Constantinople, they think that they're the true successors to Rome. So when Rome falls in 476, the Byzantine Empire continues, and they act just like the Romans did. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this Turkish warlord, Osman, is going to begin taking over provinces of the Byzantine Empire, and eventually he declares himself an independent ruler. 
Uh, he and his successors, they're going to begin conquering more provinces in modern-day Turkey. And the Byzantines, they're just not strong enough to stop it anymore. By 1354, the Ottomans have conquered enough land that they're like 100 miles away from the capital city of Constantinople. Eventually, the Ottoman Empire, it's going to stretch all the way from northern Africa to Hungary and all the way over to what is like modern-day Iran. And they're able to do this through the use of a group of soldiers called Janissaries. Now, what is a Janissary? Basically, it's an infantry unit that was created in the year 1383. Uh, they last until the year 1826. And the Janissaries, they're the first soldiers to wear uniforms and have a paid pension. They're basically young Christian boys who are forcibly conscripted uh, they're taken in by Turkish families. They're taught Turkish language, Turkish culture. They're forced to convert to Islam. And they fight in the name of the ruler, the sultan. Very strong fighting force. In many ways, they're like monks fighting monks. Or um, like Islamic monks, if you will. And there are going to be so many Janissaries in the Ottoman Empire, they eventually create their own social class, and they end up being rulers because of how much power they have. They're not allowed to have beards, and their only skill is soldiering. They're not allowed to marry. Uh, Janissary is a strictly military class. The Ottoman Empire, by the way, they are directly related to the ending of the Byzantine Empire, uh, Mehmet II is going to attack Constantinople in 1453, which was considered the modern-day Rome. And when Constantinople falls in 1453, that marks the end, the official end of the Byzantine Empire. Ironically, Mehmet II, he doesn't really change anything in Constantinople. He just wanted the, the city for himself. Um, how does he take it, though? Uh, Mehmet II, he bombards the walls of Constantinople with cannons until the walls literally fall apart. And then the Ottomans storm the castle, they kill the final Byzantine Empire, Emperor, I should say, and they claim the city is their own. The, the Hagia Sophia Church becomes a mosque, a new patriarch of the Christian Church is named, and Mehmet II is actually going to allow all the different religions to practice as long as they pay taxes to the Ottoman Empire. Once the Ottomans take control of Constantinople, that is going to become their capital city. And a, a sultan named Suleiman is going to really create the Topkapi Palace. Um, the Topkapi Palace, it's big enough to have 10 mosques. It has 14 bathhouses, 2 hospitals, over 2,000 women live there full time, and over 4,000 horses. Another really interesting figure that is associated with the Ottoman Empire is Dracula. Yes, that's right, Dracula is a real person. Uh, he was known as Vlad Tepes of Wallachia, uh, better known by us today as Vlad the Impaler or Vlad Dracul. And Dracul, or Vlad III, he is the king of Hungary, and He's going to be against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire wants to take over what is today Hungary and Transylvania. Back then it was called Wallachia. And his sole purpose is to stop the Ottomans from invading. Um, he's very, very cruel. Uh, he has somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 victims. He destroyed entire villages in an attempt to keep the Ottomans out. And... In 1462, when Mehmet II continues his reign of terror and invades Wallachia, he's welcomed by 20,000 impaled corpses, which is where Vlad gets the name Vlad the Impaler. And when Mehmet II sees all these dead bodies impaled on the side of the road, he turns around and says, no, I don't think I'm going to do this. Um, in modern-day Romania... Uh, Vlad Dracul is considered a hero because he prevented the, the kingdom from becoming part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, what happens to the real Dracula? In either 1476 or 1477, the jury is still out on exactly when it was. He's killed in, in battle. 
and he becomes the basis of the idea of Dracula and vampires. All right, really quick, two other of these gunpowder kingdoms. Uh, there's the Safavid Empire, and the Safavid Empire is going to be uh, where modern-day Iraq and Iran is. Uh, the Safavid Empire will eventually become the Persian Empire. Um, they control much of the Silk Road trade route, and just like the Ottomans had the Janissaries, the Safavids, they have a similar group of soldiers, but they're called the the Kizilbash, or Quizilbash, however you say it. Uh, the leaders of the Safavid Empire, they're Shiite Muslim. Um, they are the minority, but they control the majority. And the Sunnis who made up the majority of the people, they are heavily persecuted, which is what allows the Shiites to stay on top. Uh, this creates a lot of instability in the Safavid Empire, which actually goes on till today. Uh, ISIS and things like that are traceable all the way back to the Safavid Empire. The most interesting person that leads them is a guy named Shah Abbas, and he rules from 1588 to 1629. Um, Shah Abbas, he required everybody to practice Shiite. If you weren't Shiite, he didn't want to do anything with you. He was very paranoid and had every member of his family either blinded or killed that he didn't trust. And that did include his own son, Crown Prince Muhammad. He eventually is going to become friends with some European kingdoms because he thinks that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And it doesn't work out either because the, the Europeans expect him to convert to Christianity. And that, of course, does not happen. Eventually, some of the people on the fringes of the Safavid Empire were going to revolt, leading to a civil war, and the Safavid Empire will fall apart. But it takes a couple of years for that to happen. The third of the gunpowder kingdoms is the Mughal Empire. This is an empire that's led by Muslim leaders that will stretch over the north part of India. So basically, you have Muslim leaders who are going to be controlling Hindu people. I don't want to go too far into detail on this because I'm going to have an entire lecture on it later. But I want you to know at this point that they do exist. Um, there's going to be a dynasty that's created and it lasts from basically 1523 up until the 1800s when the British are going to take over. All right. Now the star of the lecture really is the uh, Habsburg dynasty, the Habsburg family. Uh, the Habsburgs it was originally a powerful family that married into royalty. They were from like southwestern Austria or um, northeastern um, Switzerland. As they marry into royalty, they themselves are going to rise through the ranks and become royalty themselves, meaning that they're going to rule. And eventually the Habsburgs are going to rule over Spain, parts of Italy, parts of Germany, Austria, the Holy Roman Empire. And this family lasts for a really long time, too. In the mid-1550s, um, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, he is going to divide his lands into two. And he's going to split it between his son, Philip II, and his brother, Ferdinand for the I. Now, his hope overall is that his son and his brother are going to work together, but they really don't. Uh, Philip II, his son, he has control of Spain, parts of Italy, the Netherlands, and then the American Empire, while Ferdinand gets the middle of Europe. He gets Austria, Bohemia, Hungary, and the Holy Roman Empire. So what happens? Well, Philip II is completely afraid of the Ottoman Empire, and he renews the Inquisition, he renews the Reconquista, and keeps fighting these religious wars. Ferdinand I is more worried about the Ottomans from a political standpoint, and so Ferdinand I is going to fight the Ottomans. So both halves of the family go to war, and both halves of the family start spending a lot of money. And the Habsburgs are going to go bankrupt slowly but surely. In fact, all the money coming in from America is used to fund their wars against Islam and against the Ottomans. Uh, there, obviously, since this is just an online video, 
um, I'm not going to play this. But there is a really cool video out there where some digital forensic specialists have actually gone through and um, recreated the body or the face of Vlad the Impaler and we get an idea of what he probably looked like, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, one last thing about the Habsburgs. Um, they were very, very inbred. Um, their family tree did not go very far. And they end up with this physical deformity called the Habsburg jaw. And um, I do suggest, if you're watching the video still at this point, look up the Habsburg jaw. Uh, it is this jaw that jutted out and came to a point, And it was so disfiguring that some of the Habsburgs that developed this feature couldn't eat. And before the Habsburg family actually falls apart, uh, the last couple of monarchs of Spain that were part of the Habsburg family actually couldn't reproduce, couldn't walk, couldn't do anything. So um, find this video on Vlad the Impaler if you're interested in learning more about Dracula. And then also look up the Habsburg jaw just so you can see it, how disfiguring um, it was for the Habsburgs to keep it all in the family, so to speak. All right, I appreciate you watching. And uh, I'm getting the video out for week three here pretty soon. And uh, any questions, just send me an email. Thank you so much. I appreciate you watching.